This line ran from Lake, the, from Lake of the Woods on what is now the Minnesota-Canada border, slicing southward through what are now the states of Minnesota and Iowa. And then along the western borders of Missouri, Arkansas, and Louisiana to, to, to Galveston Bay, Texas. To keep the Indians beyond the 95th meridian and to prevent unauthorized white men from crossing it, soldiers were garrisoned in a series of military posts that ran southward from Fort Snelling on the Mississippi River to Fort Atkinson and Leavenworth on the Missouri. Forts Gibson and Fort and Smith on the Arkansas, Fort Tosin on the Red, and Fort Jessup in Louisiana. <clears throat> More than three centuries had now passed since Christopher Columbus landed on San Salvador. More than two centuries since the English colonists came to Virginia and New England. In that time, the friendly Tainos who welcomed Columbus ashore had been utterly obliterated. Long before the last of the Tainos died, their simple agricultural and handicraft culture was destroyed and replaced by cotton plantations worked by slaves. The white colonists chopped down the tropical forest to enlarge their fields. The cotton plants exhausted the soil. Winds unbroken by a forest shield covered the fields with sand. When Columbus first saw the island, he described it as, quote, a very big and very level and very big and very level and the trees were very green. The whole of it so green that it is a pleasure to gaze upon, unquote. The Europeans who followed him there destroyed its vegetation and its inhabitants. Human, animal, bird, and fish. And after turning it into a wasteland, they abandoned it. On the mainland of America, the Wampanoags of Massasoit and King Philip had vanished, along with the Chesapeake's, the Chickahominess, and the and the Potomacs of the Great Powhatan Confederacy. Only Pocahontas was remembered. Scattered or reduced to remnants were the Pequots, Montauks, Nanticokes, Macapungas. Cato Catobas, Cheraz, Miamis, Hurons, Eries, Mohawks, Senecas, and Mohegans. Only Uncas was only Uncas was remembered. <clears throat> their musical names rem remained forever fixed on the American land, but their bones were forgotten in a thousand burned villages or lost in forests, fast disappearing before the axes of twenty million invaders. Already the once sweet-watered streams, most of which bore Indian names, were clouded with silt and the wastes of man. The very earth was being ravaged and squandered. To the Indians, it seemed that these Europeans hated everything in nature, the living forests and their birds and beasts, the grassy blades, the water, the soil, and the air itself. The decade following establishment of the, quote, permanent Indian frontier was a bad time for the eastern tribes. The great Cherokee nation had survived more than a hundred years of the white man's wars, diseases, and whiskey, but now it was to be blotted out. Because the Cherokees numbered several thousands, their removal to the west was planned to be in gradual stages, but discovery of the Appalachian gold within their territory brought on a clamor for their immediate wholesale exodus. During the autumn of 1838, General Winfield Scott's soldiers rounded them up and concentrated them into camps. A few hundred escaped to the Smoky Mountains, and many years later were given a small reservation in North Carolina. From the prison camps, they were started westward to Indian Territory. On the long winter trek, one of every four Cherokees died from cold, hunger, or disease. They called the march their Trail of Tears. The Choctaws, Chickasaws, Creeks, and Seminoles also gave up their homelands in the south. In the north, survi surviving remnants of the Shawnees, Miamis, Ottawas, Hurons, Delawares, and many other once mighty tribes walked or traveled by horseback and wagon 
beyond the Mississippi, carrying their shabby goods, their rusty farming tools, and bags of seed corn. All of them arrived as refugees, poor relations, in the country of the proud and free Plains Indians. Scarcely were the refugees settled behind the security of the permanent Indian frontier when thousands began marching westward through the Indian country. The white men of the United States who talked so much of peace but rarely seemed to practice it were marching to war with the white men who had conquered the Indians of Mexico. When the war with Mexico ended in 1847, the United States took possession of a vast expanse of territory reaching from Texas to California. All of it was west of the permanent Indian frontier. In 1848, gold was discovered in California. Within a few months, fortune-seeking Easterners by the thousands were crossing the Indian territory. Indians who lived or hunted along the Santa Fe and Oregon trails had grown accustomed to seeing an occasional wagon train licensed for traders, trappers, or missionaries. Now suddenly the trails were filled with wagons, and the wagons were filled with white people. Most of them were bound for California gold, but some turn, turned southwest for New Mexico or northwest for the Oregon country. To justify these breaches in the permanent Indian frontier, the policymakers in Washington invented Manifest Destiny, a term which lifted land hunger to a lofty plane. The Europeans and their descendants were ordained by destiny to rule all of America. <clears throat> they were the dominant race and therefore responsible for the Indians along with their lands, their forests, and their mineral wealth. Only the New Englanders, who had destroyed or driven out all of their Indians, spoke, spoke, about manif spoke against Manifest Destiny. In 1850, although none of the Modocs, Mojaves, Paiutes, Shastas, Yumas, or a hundred other lesser-known tribes along the Pacific coast were consulted on the matter, California became the 31st state of the Union. In the mountains of Colorado, gold was discovered, and new hordes of prospectors swarmed across the plains. Two vast new territories were organized, Kansas and Nebraska, accompanying and encompassing virtually all the country of the plains tribes. In 1858, Minnesota became a state, its boundaries being extended 100 miles beyond the 95th meridian, the permanent Indian frontier. And so only a quarter of a century after enactment of, of Sharp Knife Andrew Jackson's Indian Trade and Inter Intercourse Act, which settlers had driven in both the north and south flanks of the 95th Meridian Line, and advanced elements of white miners and traders had penetrated the center. It was then, at the beginning of the 1860s, that the white men of the United States went to war with one another, the blue coats against the gray coats. The Great Civil War. In 1860, there were probably 300,000 Indians in the United States and territories, most of them living west of the Mississippi. According to varying estimates, their numbers had been reduced by one half to two thirds since the arrival of the first settlers in Virginia and New England. The survivors were now pressed between expanding white populations on the east and along the Pacific coasts, more than 30 million Europeans and their descendants. If the remaining free tribes believed that the white man's civil war would bring any respite from his pressures for territory, they were soon disillusioned. The most numerous and powerful western tribes was the Sioux, or Dakota, which was separated into several subdivisions. The Santee Sioux lived in the woodlands of Minnesota, and for some years had been retreating before the advance of settlements. Little Crow of the of the Medukenton Santee, <clears throat> after being taken on a tour of eastern cities, was convinced that the power of the United States could not be re resisted. He was reluctantly attempting to lead his tribe down the white man's road. Wabasha, another Santee leader, also had accepted the inevitable, but both he and Little Crow were determined to oppose any further surrender of their lands. Farther west on the Great Plains were the Teton Sioux, horse Indians all and completely free. They were some, somewhat contemptuous, 
of their woodland Santee cousins who had capitulated to the settlers. Most numerous and most confident of their ability to defend their territory were the Oglala Tetons. At the beginning of the white man's civil war, their outstanding leader was Red Cloud, 38 years old, a shrewd warrior chief. Still too young to be a warrior was Crazy Horse, an intelligent and fearless teenage Oglala. Among the Hunkapapas, a smaller division of the Teton Sioux, a young man in his mid-twenties had already won a reputation as a hunter and warrior. In tribal councils, he advocated unyielding opposition to any intrusion by white men. He was Tananka Yotananka, the sitting bull. He was mentor to an orphaned boy named Gal. Together with Crazy Horse of the Oglalas, they would make history 16 years later in 1876. Although he was not yet 40, Spotted Tail was already the chief spokesman for the Brule Tetons, who lived on the far western plains. Spotted Tail was a handsome, smiling Indian who loved fine feasts and compliant women. He enjoyed his way of life and the land he lived upon, but he was willing to compromise to avoid, to avoid war. Closely associated with the Teton Sioux were the Cheyennes. In the old days, the Cheyennes had lived in the Minnesota country of the Santee Sioux, but gradually moved westward and acquired horses. Now the northern Cheyennes shared the Powder River and the Bighorn Country with the Sioux, frequently camping near them. Dull Knife in his 40s was an outstanding leader of the northern branch of the tribe. To his own people, Dull Knife was known as Morning Star, but the Sioux called him Dull Knife, and most contemporary accounts use that name. The southern Cheyennes had drifted before the Platte River, establishing villages on the Colorado and Kansas Plains. Black Kettle of the Southern Branch had been a great warrior in his youth. In his late middle age, he was the acknowledged chief, but the younger men in the, in the Hotamitonanos, Hota Hota dog soldiers of the Southern Cheyennes, were more inclined to follow leaders such as Tall Bull and Roman Nose, who were in their prime. The Arapahos, who, who, the Arapahos were old associates of the Cheyennes and lived in the same areas. Some remained with the northern Cheyennes, others followed the southern branch. Little Raven in his 40s was at this time the best known chief. <clears throat> Some of the Kansas-Nebraska Buffalo Ranges <clears throat> were the Kiowas. South of the Kansas-Nebraska Buffalo Ranges were the Kiowas. Some of the older Kiowas could remember the Black Hills but the tribe had been pushed southward before the combined power of the Sioux, Cheyenne, and the Arapaho. By 1860, the Kiowas had made their peace with the Northern Plains tribes and had become allies of the Comanches, whose southern plains they had entered. The Kiowas had several great leaders, an aging chief, Satank, two vigorous fighting men in their 30s, Satanta and Lone Wolf, and an intelligent statesman, Kicking Bird. The Comanches, constantly on the move and divided into many small bands, lacked the leadership of their allies. Ten Beards, very old, was more a poet than a warrior chief. In 1860, half-breed Kana Parker, <clears throat> who would lead the Comanches in the last great struggle to save their buffalo range, was not yet 20 years old. In the arid southwest were the Apaches, veterans of 250 years of guerrilla warfare with the Spaniards, who taught them the finer arts of torture and mutilation that never subdued them. Although few in number, probably not more than 6,000 divided into several bands, their reputation as tenacious defenders of their harsh and pitiless land was already well established. Mangus, Colorado, in his late 60s, had signed a treaty of friendship with the United States, but was already disillusioned by the influx of miners and soldiers into his territory. Co Co Cochise, his son-in-law, still believed he could get along with the white Americans. 